Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Matt Kaplan, who is a science correspondent with The Economist. He's also contributed to National Geographic, New Scientist, Nature, and New York Times. In 2014, Kaplan was awarded a Knight Science Journalism Fellowship, which he used to study the sciences at MIT and folklore at Harvard. The book we're talking about today is Science of the Magical, Science of the Magical, From the Holy Grail to Love Potions to Superpowers. Matt, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. This is a book that I I wanted to pick up because it covers so many topics I'm interested in, uh, like my favorite uh, stories, including uh, uh, The Princess Bride, but also uh, mythology uh, and uh, magic and religion. And it's, uh, it takes a scientific bent, and you have done some scientific investigation where less intrepid scientists might fear to go. You know, I, I think the really important thing to point out with this book in, partic- in particular is that, you know, it's not a paranormal book. This is a book that's really about science. And I try very hard from the very beginning to take a, a, a cool and neutral scientific approach to the myths of our ancestors. And I ask the question, okay, were they just crazy when they made this stuff up, or might they have seen things in the natural world around them and then wrote their stories or told their stories about the things that they couldn't understand to try to, to digest it? Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I think a really good example of this uh, would be something like, um, do you remember the chapter on the Vikings where I talked about Odin and Thor and the ravens that Th- sat on Odin's shoulders. That's one of the places where I think intrepid scientists would fear to go when you were chasing ravens around to see the wolf kill. So yes, I do. <laughs> yes. That, that was just wild stuff because, you know, you have this mythology associated with, with the two ravens. They were named Hugin and Mugen. And in the mythology, there's all of this anxiety over losing sight of the ravens. If you lose sight of the, aim, of the ravens, that's a really bad thing. Similarly, seeing a wolf is a good omen. And that's so weird. I mean, in, in more than just a good omen, it actually says in the Elder Edda, which is the, 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 you know, one of the few pieces of literature that we have on the Viking mythology, it says that Gir and Freak, which are the names of the two wolves, Gir and Freak feed the warfaring followers of Odin. That's so weird. Why would you say that wolves feed people? So, I mean, it, it really got me wondering uh, when, I was, when I was reading through it, and I, I got curious because ravens and wolves are kleptoparasites. They'll steal food if they can get it. And I mean, wolves in particular are competitors with a lot of the, for a lot of the food that we would normally go after. And so I, I started asking questions, as you do when you're a journalist. And I called a bunch of the wolf researchers up in Yellowstone National Park who are studying the reintroduction of, of wolves to the park because they were exterminated in the 1920s. And I said, you know, do you guys see anything interesting going on between ravens and wolves? And they said, boy, do we. Uh, They found that when wolves were reintroduced to the park, while ravens once followed grizzly bears and mountain lions and, and coyotes sort of all over the place, when wolves were reintroduced, the ravens started following the wolves to the exclusion of almost all else. And more importantly, the researchers pointed out that when they did their work, if they wanted to know where a wolf made a kill, they would actually use the ravens as their, their key identifying mark because the ravens create so much mayhem and create such a ruckus that you can see wolves making a kill from over a mile away by just looking out for ravens. That got me thinking because when you look at tribes in Africa today, the Hadza, they're hunter-gatherers, they look at vultures in the sky, they follow vultures to lion kills and then work together with spears to drive lions off their kills, grab a chunk of wildebeest, and come back to camp. Is it possible that our ancestors were doing the same sort of thing, following ravens to wolf kills, and then sewing that into their stories? And that's why I ended up in Yellowstone. I was testing out, can you follow ravens to wolf kills reliably? And, and if you were legally allowed to go and steal meat from, from wolves in Yellowstone, would that be possible? And the answer is yes. I mean, we, we ran around in the winter of Yellowstone for a week and found multiple wolf kills. Incidentally, all of that is on a matter of fact in fiction.com, my website, which records a lot of the video from this. Mm-hmm. I mean, we followed ravens first to a dumpster, and that was a little upsetting. <laughs> but then, you know, about an hour later, we found ravens taking off and followed them, and they slowly led us over this rise and then to three wolves that were circling an elk, which we caught on camera. 
And I mean, and that was just remarkable. I'd never imagined. So I think what probably happened was that the generations before the Vikings, when they were still hunting and gathering, folks used ravens to go to wolf kills, and they viewed the ravens as a divine omen because they led them to food. Mm -hmm. And they believed that the wolves were providing for them and that this was associated with Odin and that that's what we see in the mythology. You can't know for sure, but it's that's that's where ecology meets myth, and that's what a lot of the book is about. Yes, and I, I really enjoy that. There's some there's a couple of details in that in that story too. Uh, one of them is in Africa, the meat spoils pretty fast, but being in the northern latitudes, the window for accessing the meat would e- be even uh, larger, and so it e- it's even more likely that the Vikings relied upon this uh, uh, this omen. Uh, but the other thing that was interesting was that um, the ravens and the wolves kind of looked out for each other. The ravens would find prey that would be more vulnerable for the wolves from time to time, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's another side to this. And, you know, okay, fine, I just tied in uh, the Odin and, and Thor myths to ecology, but you can go the other way and go with modern mythology. I have no idea if George R. R. Martin is aware of it, but uh, there is a period of time every year where wolves find their destiny by following ravens. I mean, and, and by that point, I mean, in Game of Thrones, you've got this concept of the, the dire wolves of Winterfell, which is the symbol of the Stark family, following this raven to the north, and it's leading Brandon Stark to his destiny. Uh, in Yellowstone National Park, when the snows are at their very deepest and the winter is at its most brutal, wolves can't search around for prey very well. And so ravens, while they steal meat from wolves for most of the year, they're tolerated largely because, and we think, it's because ravens circle around over weakened elk or diseased deer and lead wolves from their dens to places where they can make a kill so it's easier for them. Mm -hmm. So the ravens are kind of earning their keep, and it's not a parasitism. The the ravens aren't stealing all year round because they're also giving back to the wolves to help them find their meat. And I just think that's so cool. And and they often play with the wolf pups sometimes, and that's they tolerated do. as well. Yeah. That is tolerated as well. So the, uh, the papers that have been coming out of, uh, th- these have largely been anecdotal findings that have been reported in the papers as, wow, we noticed that. And one of the big things they've noticed is that ravens actually come, and when the wolves are breeding, uh, or sorry, when wolf pups are, are growing and being cared for in the den, they come and they'll, they'll poke at the wolf's tail. The, the pup's tail. And in this way, they think the ravens, aside from just helping to teach pups how to, how to interact with other animals, they think what the ravens are doing is helping the, the future pack members to become comfortable with them so that when they dive in to take a bite of slain elk, the wolves don't rip them to pieces. Mm-hmm. And, and we should add that while the, the, the poem that you mentioned, the Edda, talks about Odin, there is a mention in the Bible, in the Old Testament, of ravens having been sent by God to feed Elijah when he was nearing starvation. So, Yes, I find it interesting, though, that the ravens bring bread and cheese, I think. I can't remember what it is that they actually bring him, but it's definitely not freshly slain elk. Okay. <laughs> you, don't see, you don't see ravens bringing the prophets much in the way of meat. Mm. They're always simple things. But, you know, yes, there's this concept of the raven as a provider, and I think that that's, uh, that's really where a lot of this stems from. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, uh, let's turn back to some other things that uh, are, are very prevalent both in religion and other, other uh, areas of mythology. Uh, let's, lo- let's look at healing a moment, uh, thinking yourself well and, and the Holy mm. Grail and some of that, because I found that fascinating to me. Uh, I, I belong to a, a, a church that believes in prayer and healing. Sure. And uh, there's a I, lot of I, support. I, you know, I come from the opposite end. I, I was raised largely without religion, and as a scientist, I tend to lean towards being a non-believer, although I have tremendous respect for those who are, um, one of the things that I found really amazing was in 2013, this paper slid across my desk at The Economist, and it, it, basically, it basically showed that folks who engaged in a certain type of happiness regularly had different responses in their immune systems. So the the sort of more expanded version of that is you actually have multiple types of happiness that you experience on a daily level. Uh, you can have the happiness associated with winning a thousand dollars in Las Vegas. That's known as hedonic happiness. Mm-hmm. You can also have eudaimonic happiness, which is the happiness that you feel when you help an old lady across the street, 
or do something for somebody else. We call them both happy. They're the same term, but they actually are very different expressions within your body. And researchers were collecting blood samples from people who, after doing questionnaires with these people, they were able to identify, okay, this portion of our sample population is largely eudaimonically happy, and this portion of our population is hedonically happy, and this population is depressed. And they looked at the, the gene expression in the blood of people who were eudaimonically happy and compared it to those in others, and they found that they had a 30% increase in gene expression of, of products and proteins that are associated with bacterial and viral attack, meaning that those folks had bodies that were working really hard to help them to better fight off disease. Now, that does not mean that... So, and I think that's kind of cool because you have it in certainly the biblical literature where Jesus Christ and Mark and Luke and I think Matthew as well says, your faith has healed you. Right, yes. Uh, I don't remember, know if it's Matthew. I know Mark, it's definitely present, and I think it's present in Luke a few times too. Hmm. And so, you know, that's pretty incredible that folks back then may have been on to something. Now, where, where I would disagree with the Bible, and this is the way stories go through time, they get shaped. When Jesus heals people of leprosy, I'm not convinced that you could think yourself well out of leprosy. Mm -hmm. I definitely don't think you could think yourself well out of a car accident, right. because the immune response that we're seeing is in association to viruses and infectious bacteria. But you could, let's say, if you were living a, you know, in 1000 BC, and you were ill, and your family members came around to you and said, we're all going to go together on a pilgrimage to the great temple of our God, and we're going to sacrifice our most valuable goat to help you get better, and we're going to pray for several days together. This act of pinning your fate to something much bigger than you, being with family, making a sacrifice of the family to, do, to, to this great being of belief, would, would trigger eudaimonic happiness on a really big level. And that's where I think that you start to see some truth in a lot of this fiction. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not calling all of the Bible fiction, but I'm saying that if you look at the mythology there, you can find little bits and pieces that are remarkably important. And, you know, we, we so often separate science from mythology, and that may not always be the most sensible of things. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I, 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 too, uh, think that there's, there's a mix of, mix of fact and fiction in, in a lot of the stuff that, that we are looking at in literature and mythology and, and even scripture. And um, you, you talk about the health benefits uh, that are sometimes explained by divine intervention, and, and actually biology is at work in some cases. Um, mm. But uh, the regeneration part is really interesting to me. And, and you know, I, I, another one of my favorite myths is most of Marvel comics, and you mentioned the Wolverine here in, sure. in the regeneration part. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting how that came about, looking at nature, and they see regeneration in other kinds of animals, earthworms, clams, flatworms. Um, but there's legends about regeneration, and, and we know, for instance, that the liver... Even mm -hmm. when a large portion of it is cut away, it regenerates itself in the human body. It does. It mm -hmm. does. I mean, so the work that we're talking about there is you go back to, I think it's like 1926 or something. Uh, you know, honestly, I don't remember these dates terribly well off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But we know that research done early, early on, oh, no, sorry, I'm sorry, it was 1931, a team of researchers were looking at rat livers. And they noticed that when they, they, if they cut away two-thirds of a rat liver through, via surgery and then sewed the rat back up, that within 72 hours, the liver would regenerate to its original size. They published that in the archives of pathology, and that, that finding has been replicated multiple times ever since. So it's not a fluke. Incidentally, by the way, with the Thinking Yourself Well stuff that was published in 2013, that was an interesting study but since got replicated just this year uh -huh. by another team doing it again. And that's the gold standard in science. You don't just get one interesting report. When you can repeat it multiple times, then you know you're on to something, which is why I published the Think Yourself Well stuff into this book, because otherwise I could be dis dismissed as a quack. You've got to be really careful with this. Right. But with the, the liver stuff, that what's true of the rat liver is very much true of the human liver. You can chop out huge chunks of it, and it will grow back as long as you don't die from having your liver excised. Mm -hmm. So 
that raises all kinds of questions because you've got these myths of Prometheus and another giant who killed uh, Apollo and Artemis's mother. No, he didn't kill her. The, the giant raped her, I think. Um, but either way, it, it's um, you've got all of these myths associated with heroes like Prometheus who are who are tied up or chained to rocks and left to be eaten alive by animals and the and the organ that the animals always eat is their liver right and then the liver always magically regenerates for the next day so the pain can be eternal now classicists love to argue that because the liver was the seat of the soul in ancient times that this is why the liver was selected to be the organ of torture mm-hmm. and that makes sense i buy that but the fact that the liver is the only organ in the body that regenerates at that rate raises some questions that I think are very interesting. And certainly a lot of folks in, in, the, in the world of, of medical science ask the same question. I was, I was in, interviewing uh, Dr. Uh, Tiniakos in Athens, Dina Tiniakos. She's also at Newcastle University now. And she was pointing out to me that they still require a certain degree of supernatural explanation at conferences when they talk about liver regeneration because we just don't know how it works. Right. And uh, there are the beliefs of the Greeks was that it was the source of the soul, uh, so that makes it a more important organ than say the gallbladder or the pancreas. Um, but there's also uh, an, an, uh, this protein, Lin twenty eight, which uh, is more prevalent in infants that has something to do with rapid healing. Yeah, so you're talking about Dr. George Daly's work at Harvard Medical School. I got I got a, a lot of time to talk to George last year because he I was at Harvard as a fellow. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is that we are moving, I would say, remarkably slash perilously close to being able to make something like the Wolverine from Mar- Marvel Comics a reality. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason I say perilously is because uh, what, what folks can do is amazing, but we just need to tread so slowly and make sure that what we do is both right and not going to harm anybody. So here's the deal. There is this, this compound known as LIN28, and LIN28 is found in, in, in fetuses and then also in babies, and it's at its highest concentrations when you're really, really young. And as you get older, LIN28 fades from your system. And, so, and as it fades, your ability to heal rapidly fades. Do you have any kids? I don't, but I, I was fascinated by the the thing about not cutting the fi- the fingernails thing that you mentioned there. Yeah, our daughter is now ten months old, and I promise you, we have missed on several occasions cutting her fingernails. Mm-hmm. And when you don't cut a baby's fingernails, they take their hands and they claw their face, and then you you come in to look at them in the crib and go, "Oh my God, I'm a terrible parent. I'm going straight to hell." Mm-hmm. And um, then you are assuaged by the fact that 24 hours later, all the wounds are gone. Unlike me, when I scratch myself now, I'm almost 40, I, it takes me a couple of days to heal, sometimes a week. But scratches on babies heal like you know, lightning fast. It's crazy. And the reason for that is down to LIN-28. So a team started exploring just what you could do with LIN-28, and they found that when LIN-28 was expressed in mice to be uh, released at a particularly high level, such that the LIN-28, the gene for LIN-28 stuck around for, you know, all, all the way into adulthood. They found that the mice could have their ears cut, they could have toes chopped off, and they would grow back. Now, you can't do that with people. There are all kinds of laws right. against <laughs> giving somebody, you know, genetically engineering somebody to manufacture lots of LIN-28 and then chop off their finger. And also, it's not Wolverine speed. The mice would regenerate within a day. Mm-hmm. Hugh Jackman on the screen regenerates in 10 seconds. Right. And so, you know, we're not quite at the X-Men level, but still, can you imagine if you generated soldiers who had the ability to regrow themselves very rapidly and heal their wounds at, within a 24-hour period? That would be staggering stuff. Uh, but the problem with all of this is that LIN-28 also is shut off for a reason, if you keep LIN-28 as an adult, you start to develop cancer. Right, it causes your cells to replicate out of control. And so one of the ways in which I think LIN-28 use is going to make very good use is in people who are suffering from kidney failure. Um, right now, if your kidneys pack up, the only real way to help you is to put you on dialysis. And dialysis is awful. 
my grandfather, when he was 88 years old, he had type 2 diabetes, his kidneys were failing, and the doctors all said, look, we can give you another 5 to 10 years of life, but you're going to have to be on dialysis. dialysis. My grandfather opted for death. He said, I don't want it. Do not put me on dialysis. Let my kidneys fail. Let me die. I don't want it. It's just too terrible. Because he knew a lot of people who had been on it. It's, it's really unpleasant. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting is you could potentially use Lin-28 to regenerate the kidneys so that your kidneys would grow back and then you wouldn't need the dialysis. The, the trick is going to be giving somebody a burst of Lin-28 so that it's just there long enough to regenerate the kidneys and not give you cancer. And so that's, that's the work that Harvard Medical School has cut out for it. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to touch briefly on uh, uh, transformation into animals and, and super soldiers because of the, uh, the, the element of, of herbs that Greeks seem to know a lot about in, in ancient times. Uh, oh, sure. At... Although I don't know how the heck you touch on that briefly. <laughs> that's super right. soldiers and turning people into animals, that is a cornucopia of material. But here, I, I can tell you about the, the really early stuff, which is, you know, you've got Circe, who is this witch who turns Odysseus from the Odysseys, his men, into animals. Um, she, the story goes, they're on this island called Aea, they're starving and exhausted, they're looking for some place to go, and half of Odysseus's men stumble upon, upon this mansion. And this woman walks out and says, here, come on in, I'll give you food, I'll give you shelter, and all but one of them go in, she feeds them food, and then she takes out her wand, and she turns them all into beasts. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, one of the men runs off and goes and gets Odysseus and says, Odysseus, Odysseus you've got to go and help. And Odysseus comes running back, and he is met by the god Hermes, the messenger god. And Hermes says, slow down, take this. And he gives him a milk-white flower with a black root that separates very easily at the center from the soil. And he says, consume this, and Circe will have no power over you. So for years, all of this tale has been, oh, oh yeah, incidentally, Odysseus then consumes the flower, Circe feeds him her food, holds her wands to him, and the magic has no effect, and he holds his sword to her and says, drop your wand, and he succeeds in saving his men. Mm-hmm. Um, this story has been dismissed as fiction for centuries, but in recent years, folks have started to say, you know, there's all this description of plants in it, and Circe's feeding them stuff. In fact, the literature says into the food she mixed baneful drugs such that the men would forget their, their native land. And if you look at the really early artwork that we have from the Odyssey you know, on the sides of, of pottery, Circe is not holding her wand out at people as a, a, as a wizard would. She's putting her wand into a cup and stirring. Mm-hmm. So uh, the argument that's been made for a really long time is it Circe, you know, for, you know, 30 years now, is that Circe was using thorn apple, or no, also known as Datura's Dramonium, which is this, it's this really nasty chemical cocktail, which causes vivid hallucinations, it makes it difficult for people, people to separate reality from fantasy, it, it causes bizarre behavior, it causes amnesia, it's just an all-around nasty drug, and that she was using this to make the men believe they'd been turned into animals. Mm-hmm. Similarly, uh, so, but uh, on the other side, with, the, with regards to the milk white flower, no one's had any real idea what that might have been. Then, in 1951, a pharmacologist in Russia named Mikhail Moskovsky was traveling in the Ural Mountains, and he came across a village where people were treating children who were suffering from polio with a milk white flower and a black root. They were crushing the flower into a poultice, massaging it into the legs of the children, and when he asked them, what are you doing, they said, we're going to stop the paralysis from the polio by putting this flower into the skin of our children. He took it back to the lab and found that there was a, a dramatic effect in the flower. It had a neurotransmitter protector in it that kept polio from harming the neurons in the children's bodies. That drug made its way into Bulgaria and eventually into the rest of the Western world. And today, if you have any family suffering from Alzheimer's disease, they're taking a drug called galantamine, and it comes from a milk-white flower with a black root. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1983, a couple of researchers at the 12th World Congress of, of Neurology uh, tested, uh, uh, proposed that the white flower that Hermes gave Odysseus was in fact snowdrop, and that this drug galantamine is actually found in the Odyssey. They tested it on rats. They gave rats the flower before giving them datura poisoning, 
and they found that the flower functioned as a perfect antidote and protector against the poisoning of datura and suggested that there was actually a lot of biochemistry in this myth. Mm-hmm. And so that, that story is all explored inside, inside this book, which was an enormous amount of fun to write. Yeah, it, 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 it is interesting, and, and I didn't want to do an injustice to that by saying it briefly, but we only have a couple minutes left, and I, I don't want to leave out uh, the, the stuff about summoning storms. Uh, because in there you talk about the research of a climatologist at the University of Leeds who is going to make milder hurricanes but may have actually come up with a way to nullify some of the negative effects of climate change. And so I want to touch on that one as well. Yeah, well, with COP20 going on right now in Paris this very week, this is uh, perhaps the most, uh, most important areas of magic. And in fact, if you read The Economist this week, in our very front article, uh, one of the things that we write about is that you can use ocean mist to blast up into the air and create clouds. Now, why does creating clouds matter? Well, hurricanes are created when you, you blast, uh, when, sorry, hurricanes are created when water gets very, very warm. You have runaway evaporation, and you get this cycling where the evaporated water from the ocean goes shooting up into the sky. It gets cold, it falls back down as rain, and then it shoots back up into the sky again, and you get this revolution effect, and eventually it circles and you get a horrendously powerful storm. If you could create cloud cover in the hurricane-generating parts of the world, you could reduce the ocean temperature, and you could reduce the potential for hurricanes to form. And so that's what a lot of folks are starting to propose, and we talk about this ability to control the weather because Native Americans once danced to draw rain in certain locations, and now what was once the stuff of total mythology is now very much the stuff of reality. There are all kinds of dangers with this, because if you, sh- if you create clouds in one area, by like shooting ocean water up into the sky and creating mist, you can potentially mean, make it so that rain doesn't fall in other areas and cause drought. So it, it's, it's a very challenging and difficult proposition to suggest that we should control the weather, but there's no question that we can. And that's, that's pretty remarkable stuff. And I think that that is probably the only way we're going to save ourselves with regards to climate change in the long run. Mm-hmm. Very interesting uh, treatment of several issues there. And, and, and the conclusion of the book, as we have a couple of minutes left, is that you talk about how our ancestors had a magical worldview. Uh, so many of them did through so much of time. And, and you're advocating for the ability to suspend disbelief. Uh, and, and, you know, knowing how something magical works shapes our experiences of it. But... Um, uh, it's also true that uh, it might be that a non-believer um, is uh, somehow less than that of a believer, but that's not so for you. I, yeah, so I think it's arrogant and callous to suggest that someone who is a believer is somehow missing out or some, that a non-believer is somehow missing out. Each has a very different viewpoint on the world, and the only thing that I can say for some, with some certainty for having, ha- having written this book is that once you walk down the path of becoming a non-believer, it's impossible to walk back and become a believer again. As soon, when your world is crackling with magic and you accept that the gods and powers of sorcery are involved, as the Vikings did, there's no way for you to look at things any other way until you become aware of the scientific method and start understanding so oh, okay this mead that i drink is actually infused with henbane and that's why i can enter a berserker rage if you were to tell the vikings that they were drugging themselves they'd hack you to pieces because right. they believed so completely in odin mm-hmm. um, but once you enter into a society where belief doesn't exist or belief is challenged it's very hard to become a believer again on the full scale and that shapes the way we perceive things but it doesn't make them worse. It just makes them different. Mm -hmm. And the final sentence in this marvelous book, Science of the Magical, is, uh, I'd argue that science and magic are not as much at odds with each other as we tend to think. I might even describe the experience of discovering the science behind our myths as magical. We've been talking with Matt Kaplan. The book is Science of the Magical, From the Holy Grail to Love Potions to Superpowers. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I remind you, if you don't hear our broadcast four times as it occurs on 88FM, you can also catch us on YouTube channel, which is Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening.